Hello, guests and ghouls, and welcome to Quest Friends Hereafter, an improvised fiction podcast using the Under the Neighborhood role-playing system. I am Kyle, he, him, and today I, my four best friends, and some dice are going to tell you a story about what the Scooby-Doo crew might be up to 20 years down the line. But before we get started with that, we got to introduce all of our players today. Hi, I'm Tom. My pronouns are he, him. I play Hilda Mishkevich, the guardian who pulls pranks, who is she, her. Okay, it's my turn. Hello, I am Doug Dimadome, owner of the Dimsky. <laughs> <laughs> well, we weren't having... I didn't want to go first because it would be funnier if somebody else went before me and then I said that. But anyways, <laughs> now that my job is done, hello, I am Ari. <laughs> My pronouns are she, her, and I play Kiki, pronouns he, him, and he's the opportunist who adapts. I'm Emily, my pronouns are they, she, and I play Irene Hawthorne, the necromon trainer who overextends, and her pronouns are she, her. I'm Hallie, she, her, and I play Sparky Malarkey, also she, her, the intuition who investigates. And as I said, my name is Kyle, he, him, I am your game master today, which means for the most part, I play anyone and everything else. So we've got a fun adventure for you today and I want to jump straight into it. But first, I have an apology to make. Hit the apology music. So our system that we play uses something called adventure points or AP. You can get adventure points many ways. One of them is with failed rolls. I didn't reward AP for failed rolls. You all have so many points on the table. So to make up for that, everyone is going to start this adventure with two AP, unless you already had two AP banked, in which case you will start with three AP. Three AP. (laughs) But with that out of the way, like with all episodes, we got to talk about slice of life complications. In this one, you were all able to give a complication to as many other people as you wanted, provided it wasn't zero. So yeah. What complications do we got? So I had a complication. At first, it was just for Irene, because the complication was that there is this movie premiering specifically today that Irene has watched the trailers for this movie and she has been super excited about this movie coming out and everything. And she, of course, wants to go to the premiere of this movie so that nobody else spoils it for her and so that she can spoil it for everybody else. (laughs) But... There's two problems. The first one is that her parents and her siblings and all of that stuff are too busy today to take her to this premiere. And the second and most important problem is that the movie is (laughs) PG-13. And so that's why I asked her age, because this town has a really strict policy of PG-13. And if you're not 13, you cannot come to this movie. So she either has to find an adult to go to the movie with, (laughs) or... She has to sneak in somehow because she really has to see this movie premiere today. That is my complication. (laughs) That's so fucking good. (laughs) Fucking exquisite. Beautiful. Well, time to go home. (laughs) Pack it up. No topping that. No. Okay, I cannot follow up that one well, (laughs) but my complication is that Booker has been getting jealous of Hilda's textbooks and he ate her homework. (laughs) He ate her homework. That's so cute. Oh, no. My complication works really well with that because my complication was for Hilda and it's um, she's missing her first library book and there's a fee for it now. I love that we are all putting complications to the children. Why has this happened? Well, we got them last time. I mean, yeah, because last time it had to be Kike or Sparky, so you're just letting Mm -hmm. out the excitement for the other characters. So we're just spreading the wealth here. It's true. Fuck you. All right, Tom, what's what's yours? Um, mine is for Irene. (laughs) Oh my god! Oh no, it's only the kids! Throwing stones! I, mm, it was channeling some recent poke rage, but, um... One of the science teachers at school has been wasting Irene's time recently trying to, like, go over Necromon-related science facts, which Irene is already aware of. The problem with this class is that I know everything. And unfortunately, 
This is part of an assignment, and so Irene needs to turn in a total of 15 new Necromon-related observations <laughs> each week. And this is the last day with which to accrue them before the next batch needs to be turned in. Oh, dear. So, any, any, any favorites among that list? Uh, movie. Uh, uh, PG-13 for days. Obviously. Oh, I'm so happy you liked it. Yeah. Leagues above. Leagues. I, I really like the booker getting jealous and eating books. However, we do have a penchant for just deciding to do all of them all the time. So I can already think of ways to throw in the other ones. The Booker thing has happened in between or part of the reason Hilda can't go is because she's been grounded. So Sparky is under orders not to let her go in as the adult. And the reason is because Hilda's grounded because her book is late. <laughs> Hilarious. They trusted Sparky Malarkey with this task. It's a test for both of you. <laughs> Anyways, uh, before we start, let's let's figure out some details about this movie. So it's a Lucas Bang movie, obviously. Obviously. Because Lucas Bang is a bit of a celebrity in the Valley, which we'll get into more detail about that later. What makes a... I, I need to look up what actually is the criteria for something being PG-13. Hold on. They're allowed one F word. Yeah, one F word. My first thought is mild sexual content. So... Name of the movie is Bang Bang with two exclamation points. Bang Bang. It's a Lucas Bang theme movie. And for reasons related to Sparky, I want mild sexual content to be one of the reasons that it is banned. No. <laughs> so Sparky wants to see that movie. I feel like the movie needs to include like some spicy scenes featuring Lucas Bang. Oh yeah, shirtless. What if since you wanted Kike to be there because he's taking Yunwen to that place, what if Yunwen also wants <laughs> to be in this movie oh. despite she being like really small and he being like, mm, okay, I guess I'll, I'll just cover your eyes during the mild sexual scene part. Amazing. Actually thinking more about it. I, I feel bad Kika taking uh, an eight-year-old to a PG-13, so he would probably just take her to another movie that's <laughs> more kid-appropriate. I like thought, I was like, wait a second, that's probably Well, that's fine, because in either case, the event is still going to be Lucas Bang is getting signatures. Right. So like, oh yeah, go see your hero, the aggressive bandit, and then we'll go watch... Um, Benefer's garden. <laughs> Benefer is like the in sync of our universe. Yes, back together. Guess who's back? I know that's Backstreet's boys, but I don't care. Back again. They're like the in sync, and they're a bunch of fucking Stella friends. Skeletons. The B is for bones. B is for bones. Oh, B Enifer. And they sing songs the equivalent of "My Shiny Teeth and Me." My shiny teeth and yes. me. About the human body. My shiny teeth and me. If I could make up lyrics, I would make up a song right now about the radius and the ulna. Oh, perfect. Yeah. That I feel like is the kind of quality they're they're going for. And I mean, I did once when I went to the theater to see something else. So fucking actor's voice actor Gael Garcia in the theater it was before Coco but like he was already famous he was just there I didn't know who he was and I just basically like stood really close to him being like why are there so many people in here and he looked at me with this like what the fuck face and then I learned later but like so sometimes you know famous people are in fact at movie theaters okay let's get started well, gang, we've made it inside Miss Victoria's Manor. It's time to find the monster that's been haunting her art collection and make him Van Gogh home. <laughs> but because uh, Van Gogh was an artist... You should stop trying to be funny. <laughs> I just got it! A great one, Elliot! Thanks, Lucas. I thought for a moment that someone's sense of humor was... Baroque and <laughs> You don't have to humor him, Lucas. He'll just keep doing it. Well, I for one think your boyfriend just has good taste. But uh, why is he here again? Because Alina and Chaz are investigating Miss Victoria's mausoleum and we need someone else who's good at finding things. Oh, you you mean besides me? I mean besides me. Lucas, babe, chop chop, let's go! Well, you know, Sparky, uh, when you said you needed help, I thought you just 
needed the ride. I don't know whether I should tag along or anything like that. Well, in that case, Lucas can stay by the car, and I'll go with... Oh, no, no! He'll be fine. Right, Lucas? Right, babe? Oh, oh, I, I will? <laughs> yeah, you got this. Right. Right, I, I will. Uh, Sparky's right. I, I can help. Uh, are, are you sure? Because I think it makes more sense for us to... Oh, split up? Exactly what I was going to suggest. <laughs> Sparky, I... We'll see who finds more clues this time. Uh, you know, I just... Uh... Lucas, Lucas, babe, babe, calm down. You're like the dandelion and the necromouse, but it isn't cute this time, because we've got work to do. Uh, you're, you're... you're right. I just I need to take a moment to get my bearings, and oh my gosh, that bookshelf <laughs> Ooh. Is it a g g g g g ghost? Lucas, you see ghosts every day. Our homeroom teacher is a banshee. <laughs> right. It's just a secret door behind a bookshelf that leads to a library with an ancient clock that hides a second hidden staircase, which we can walk up to to get into a dusty old attic. It's the kind of stuff you'd find in any house, babe. <laughs> All right, we've got some desks, a bunch of cobwebs, and, hello, Sarvian nesting dolls. What mysteries do you hold? Uh, Sparky? The piders aren't venomous, just poisonous. You'll be fine as long as you don't eat them. You didn't eat them, did you? <laughs> uh, no, I, I think I found something over here in the desk drawer. Desk drawer? Well, that's no fun. <laughs> Is, is this a clue? Did I find a clue? If artwork you seek, then you must shed dimensions and become the art. The fuck is this kind of clue? <laughs> yeah, I, I recognize that. It's a poem. A haiku. <gasps> it's a haiku. Hi, Clue. Ugh, the real mystery is what literary jackass took the time to write this out. What do you think, melting monster version of Van Gogh? <laughs> Zoinks! Romance isn't the only thing making these lovebirds' hearts race. Will they escape Van Gogh's oily clutches? What clues will Elliot unearth? Where will Chaz and Alina's investigation lead them? Captivating cryptids and capers await next time on The Pickle Pals. Oh man, Chaz Casey here with Scorpion Radio. What you all just listened to was an episode of The Pickle Pals. Now, The Pickle Pals was a little radio play inspired by my times as part of the Private Investigators Corporation Limited Enterprises, or Pickle, group in high school. We investigated all sorts of spooky mysteries and stuff like that. Now, the pilot episode you listened to was done on a bit of a shoestring budget. The only voices came from yours truly and uh, Rhonda from The Office. But dang if it wasn't one hell of a time. Anyways, we're playing this episode in honor of our very own aggressive bandit, Lucas Bang, who's back in town not only for the Scuba Corps International Necromon Championship, but to promote his brand new film, Bang Bang. Uh, before we get to our next rockin' song, we have... An advertisement from Scuba Core Unlimited for the Scuba Core Nightly Mattresses. Scuba Core Mattresses. Have you ever wondered? And there's a little click as Sparky Malarkey quickly turns off the radio that she's been listening to in her house. So Hallie, tell me a bit about where Sparky Malarkey lives and besides listening to this radio program, what she's up to in the mornings. Uh, Sparky Malarkey has a lovely ranch-style single-story trailer van in a junkyard slash 
graveyard. It is both things, but they are not to be confused with each other. Sparky's van is actually super dope. It has a lot of hanging beads inside it, sometimes full hanging scarves that blocks the little like loft corner that she calls her bed. No, it's not a waterbed. I thought for a second that I'm making it a waterbed, but it's just, it's not. It was a waterbed, but then it leaked. So now it's just a very thin mattress that has no support. She had a mouse problem recently. They just shooed straight through it. No. So now it's just a flat mattress that she's augmented with pillows. She's making do. She's making do. Um, The kitchen is really just like a small mini fridge filled with like skater aid, which is for teenagers. But you know, she skated once, so she still drinks it. Skater aid and let's not forget Capri Fun which is the uh, alcoholic fun summer drink. Um, And there are two coffee makers. That's because when one is dirty, she just uses the second one. And then they're both dirty and she washes both of them and then goes through the cycle again. This is much easier for her than washing one coffee pot at a time. It doesn't make sense to anybody else. Sure makes sense to her. Yeah, and I imagine, if it's all right that I kind of mention things, I imagine you've kind of got clothes spilling all over the place. (laughs) Oh yeah, there's a closet, but there's like audio recording equipment and like a tripod for a camera she doesn't have and things that aren't clothes that don't go in closets and your like cool jean jacket that's all like stiff and angular i imagine it's just hanging over the slightly open fridge oh yeah like it that's what it does it blocks the cold air from coming out because uh because the fridge doesn't close all the way (laughs) it makes for great air conditioning in the summer yeah it's wonder i mean it's hot in the valley so this really serves two purposes Sparky's very um, efficient and resourceful with what she has. Um, There are no seats. There are just floor pillows everywhere, but that's because she's cool and she's got a vibe, man. There is a small old school radio, which is the thing that she was listening on. She has a TV, one of those really small ancient ones that's like really thick. It does not belong in this trailer. It is too big. She has to climb over it in order to get to the place where her bed is. (laughs) But it's there and that's what she watches her things on. She likes that it has a VHS player. One of the complications I had thought about Sparky was regarding a VHS player and she having to look a specific VHS. She sure has one. I am so upset that she actually has one. God help us. Yeah, she's golden on VHS. DVD, ah, that's too new. Blu-ray, never heard of it. It's too new. It doesn't feel as satisfying. Like holding a DVD is not as satisfying <laughs> as holding like a VHS tape, which has like a shape and a weight, you know? And she does use the TV to keep up her water mattress. Luckily, the TV isn't broken after the water mattress leaked. It's fine. She's not sure how that happened, but old tech is really reliable. Yeah, those things above all else are sturdy. Anyway, so you're thinking about VHSs and DVDs. Yeah. When you're rattled out of your thoughts by the most conventional, straightforward, three-pronged knock that you could ever hear on your door. Um, I turn the radio back on. So put in code. Oh, Christ. C-H-Z-Z-Z. Three Z's for the sleep. At scubamattress.com for 15% off. I turn it up louder, but I change the channel so it's not the radio show I was listening to. Welcome to MPR Radio Mortician's public radio station. <laughs> Today's survey, the skeleton of Theseus. <laughs> now, the skeleton of Theseus is a theoretical experiment where if Theseus loses one of his bones and um and eventually you just hear the door open behind you, just a little click as it opens. So can you prosecute yourself for opening someone else's door, or are you just above the law? Is that, is that how that works? Sparky, I assumed the door would be open for an old friend. Sparky, you turn over and you see an average-looking man with round glasses pressed up against his pale face. He's wearing a perfectly fitted gray suit coat, and his floppy black hair curls out from underneath a plain Hamburg hat. 
If you had to figure out who he was, he wouldn't really stand out in the crowd because the way I like to describe him is if Waldo went corporate. This is Elliot. Elliot was a member of Pickle. Pickle stands for um, Private Investigators. Oh no. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Private Investigators Corporation Limited Enterprises. It was a group of plucky teens who went around solving mysteries for the local townspeople. Definitely not a la Scooby-Doo style. We didn't, we didn't just, it's Scooby-Doo. It's their Scooby-Doo gang. It's their mystery ink. Did you have a dog too? We did not have a dog. It was just us four and sometimes a fifth person. Well, if the gang comes back together, you could have a mouse. <laughs> I have that written down, Ari. Oh, yes. Get off of my notes. <laughs> for God's sake. Yeah, so it was typically the four of you. Sometimes you'd be followed along with folks by Lucas Bang, but the core four was Sparky Malarkey, Elliot, Chaz Casey, and then finally your last member, Alina Miskiewicz. Miskiewicz. And yeah, the four of you went down and did mysteries, but you've all kind of gone your separate ways. You know, Chaz Casey's got his radio show. Sell out. Alina got married and had a kid. Weird. And then Elliot, ever the overachiever, he was always the young, plucky upstart of the group, went on to be one of the prosecutors for the Bureau of Intermortal Enforcement. He wasn't the leader. He just made everyone sandwiches and told everyone where to go and did all the work. But he uh, he abandoned Pickle when he graduated from high school and you know, went on to go to college for like law or whatever. And now he's a prosecutor and that just, you know, sucks. And as Elliot stands there in his nice suit and his nice hat, just brushing one of your random pieces of clothing, like some socks and some pants, just like to the side under the table. He looks down and looks back up to you and says, I assume I haven't found you at a bad time, have I, Sparky? I don't know how to respond because Sparky doesn't know how to respond. So um, instead, she'll just shrug. Well, fair enough. I will keep this visit brief then. I don't want to get in the way of any of that. And he looks back at like the tripod and the little heist board hidden behind all this stuff. Investigative work that you do. You know, it is very important. I'm sure. What did, I, I'm actually very curious. What exactly are you working on? Some sort of issue with food processing or something like that? And you can see he's pushed some stuff to the side and is pointing at the image you have in the center of the Heisborg with a rutabaga on it. As a matter of fact, I am uncovering a story the townspeople will be very interested in because, you know, um, rutabagas are a scam. And I cannot legally elaborate any further. And she pushes the heist board a little bit further into the closet. Rutabaga, Sparky. What? The plural of rutabaga is rutabaga. Says who? Uh, says the, the English language. Well, the English language is a bunch of corporate hacks who just want to control the way people speak and think and feel. <sighs> All right, so you haven't budged on that point, I see. Sparky, the Bureau has everyone's interests in mind. They're a natural extension of your work with Pickle. Natural extension of the work with Pickle? This is the natural extension of the work with Pickle, gestures to everything around her. He just looks around. Right. You know why? Because Pickle fights for the underdogs. The Bureau fighting for everybody. Everybody who matters by their definition of what matters. Which, by the way, is as constrictive as the English language. I'll just cut to the chase, Sparky. You have spirit. Something that the old ghosts of the Bureau, ironically, could use. I just believe you could use your talents in more productive ways. Productive ways. More productive ways. You know, when this Rutabaga story hits, you're gonna be, you're gonna be... Ruining your words. Is that correct? Ru- You're going to be ruining your words. More commonly, people would say the phrase, rue the day. But in either case, Sparky, I'm simply saying that I talked to some of the folks at the prosecution office in the bureau, and we have an open spot. Even if you don't want to be in the law room, we've got spots for prosecutors. We've got spots for investigators. There are dangerous people doing dangerous work out there, Sparky, with... Rutabagas? Rutabaga 
and substantial things as well. You know, I don't know if uh, you heard, but there was a huge necromouse infestation a while ago, and I was at the center of that. I stopped the problem. So um, just because my work is on the streets and not in an office with a skylight doesn't mean it doesn't have... What was the word you used? Oh, did, did you forget it was spirit? Sparky um, bites her lip a little bit, which she does when she's really fucking mad, and says, So you can't even answer when you're called out on being a dick? Sparky, I'm here to offer you a job and- Yeah, for like the fourth time. I've told you I don't want it. I didn't ask you to go around asking for open positions. I just- Sparky, I just want what's best for you. Oh my god, you just want what's best. Maybe what's best for me is exactly what I'm doing. What's best for you? Sitting in a van. By the there port, <laughs> right next to the hereafter. Do you know how many, how many, do you know how much danger comes from the hereafter? I'm an investigative reporter, Elliot. That's where the job is. Investigating what? I'm right Sparky? at the heart of the action. Rutabaga? I'm on the scoops. Investigating Just Rutabaga? because you're too much of a coward to step down from your ivory serious matters tower out there. And wear real clothes. Fraud? Yeah, yeah, and you're not going to know murder? about them until I crack them. <sighs> I can see this is going nowhere. So, oh, it took you that long to find that out, huh? And he tries to find a spot on your table and doesn't see one. So he just lays a business card on top of <laughs> just a pile of clothing. Think about it. I will keep this position open, but there are lots of people who want it. And he opens the door and before he leaves, he turns back to you and says, I hope you'll join us someday in the future, Sparky. We're all waiting for you. And with that, Elliot walks out. Uh, he's out of screen. This isn't, he's, this isn't gonna matter, but Sparky's gonna, hey, don't let the door hit you on the way out, because it actually does that. You gotta, you gotta open it a certain way or it'll hit you, but you wouldn't figure that out on your own. And then she goes and slams it shut and, like, jimmies the lock, which doesn't work that well all the time. And then she's gonna pick up a random pillow from the floor and put it over her face and go, <laughs> And then she's going to breathe and she's going to take her jacket from the fridge and she's going to replace it with a scarf. And then she thinks closer on it, removes the scarf, opens the fridge, takes a skater aid, puts that back, takes the Capri Fun, slams it again, sets the scarf back, turns off the radio, which was on this entire time because I never turned it off. So in the end, which is the true skeleton of Theseus? Nothing is the skeleton of Theseus. The one that has been replaced, or the one with the original bones reassembled? The answer may surprise you after this break. Sparky's just gonna turn off the radio and go, fucking Theseus, fucking Elliot, God, she's just, just like, oh man, oh, this is what's best for you, Sparky. Oh, I'm a prosecutor and I have suits and I work at an office. And, and that's when your phone dings and you get a text message. Hey, boss. Just wondering what the ETA is waiting at the usual spot. Fuck, Elliot, making me late. She texts, important meeting ran long, coming now. And then she'll set her phone down and fix her jacket, bust up her hair a little bit behind its headband, throw on some sunglasses and she's out. The door hits her on the way out because she forgets about the fact that it hits people on the way out. Hilda just sends a thumbs up emoji. everybody and welcome to Scorpion Radio. I am not Chaz Casey. I'm still figuring out Chaz Casey's voice. I am Kyle though and this is the announcement break. Hi, welcome to the announcement break. I hope you're enjoying today's episode. There's not much for you on this announcement break. In fact, normally when we have an announcement break like this where we don't really have any announcements or any ads, I may end up skipping it for the week, but I wanted to let you know that I might do that before I actually just do it. So now that I've got you here, I wanted to mention two quick things. The first one is, did you know that our episodes have chapters? If you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on Apple Podcasts, you should be able to scroll down and see a list of chapters. 
These are ways that I have segmented the episode into distinct chunks that usually equate to about every scene or so. These chapters are embedded into the MP3s, so with other podcasting apps, you might have them, you might not, I'm not actually sure, but if you do have access to them, it's just a helpful way of jumping straight to a scene you might want to listen to. So I figured I'd mention that. I also wanted to quickly explain why we were laughing at Doug Dimmodome, owner of the Dimsdale Dimmodome, a reference to the cartoon show The Fairly Odd Parents. And the reason for that is because Hallie finds it hilarious. You see, something you have to understand about Hallie is that there are certain jokes that just get her. We don't know why, we don't know how, but about every half a year or so, we'll discover a new phrase that will just make Hallie laugh uncontrollably. So if you ever hear us just start saying some random phrase, assume we found another one. Finally, before we go, I want to try ending each episode with a call to action. So last episode, I talked a lot about things you could do if you wanted to support us on Patreon, but not everyone can or wants to support us financially. So what's the next best way to support us if that's something you're interested in doing? And it's to mention the show to a friend. So before our episode comes out in two weeks, I'd love it if you could just mention this show to one friend. Who knows? Maybe you will find a fellow listener to talk about all of the standing in line drama we're about to get through in the second half of this episode. All right, that's all I've got for you today. Our next episode of Bang Bang Part 2 will be coming out in two weeks on Monday, May 30th. But if you'd like additional stories, podcasts, or behind-the-scenes videos, you can find them at patreon.com slash questfriends. I will see you there. Okay, so it has been about a month since your last adventure, since for the most part, the time between adventures, the time between episodes is going to be the same in universe as out of universe. So it's been about a month since Hilda and Irene had their first fight with each other, since Hilda got into the Necromon Dueling Club and found herself to be rivals with both Walnut in a very friendly way and Irene in a different way. It's also been a month since the Necromouse infestation, where Kike befriended a King Pecker named Toucan, and Sparky flooded the streets with Necromice and Kike clones. Sparky solved the flooding the streets with Necromice. Right. Uh, <laughs> unrelated, Kike also managed to stop the cloning device after having a heart-to-heart -heart with one of his key clones. And Sparky, last time we saw her, had a single Necro Mouse in one of her Necro cards and then a bunch of Necro cards that she owes money for. And I have one hard move saved up for that. Fuck, I forgot about that. Damn it. All right. Yes, fine. But in the month since all of that happened, what have you all been up to? What's been going on in the past month? So Kike, in the meantime, has fixed the hole in his fence caused by this bird token. But the way that he has fixed it is that he built like a little like cabin slash nest. Like one of the walls is the side of the fence and the other part is just a little nest for Toucan to come and live there whenever he can. And there's even a little sign that just says bird, except it only says erd because part of it has been eaten <laughs> by Toucan. So it's just like a bite and it says erd in it, but it's supposed to say bird. I love it. And inside of the little thing, there's, you know how like cats have scratching posts? There's hanging up just a cylinder of cement for yes. Toucan the King Pecker to just jackhammer into at all hours of the night. Yes, there's yeah. a lot of bricks. There's a lot of, of things that Kike thinks Toucan might want to eat. You found some nice stuff in your neighbor's house. Yes, definitely. Definitely from the neighbor. 
Um, Tukan doesn't isn't strictly Kike's pet. He sometimes leaves and sometimes comes back. But like you know, that's that's part of his house. So sometimes it's just there. So that's mostly what has been happening. Also, Kike because he had a little bit of an existential crisis when speaking with the key clone. He painted a little like. It's not like a tattoo because it can be removed because Kike doesn't want to commit to actual tattoos, but it's like a little like swirly hair looking thing in like ink or whatever oh. on his scalp or whatever. And it can be looked under the beret sometimes as a way to try to look cooler for Ariel, which I don't know if it has worked or not, but he is certainly trying to be more cool that way. God bless. They acknowledged it. That's the most you got, was neutral acknowledgement that it was there. Perfect. Anyways, that is all that has happened of relevance in a month for Kiki. All right, anything else notable in anyone else's lives? So Hilda has spent much of this month trying to just get used to the new school, get used to new friends, spend some time continuing to attempt to bond with Booker and learn the extent of these new Necromon powers and how to be a skilled necromon trainer and something interesting you've learned that perplexed you walnut and freddy is that you know most necromon are a little bit stronger in the battlefield they've got that protective covering but typically necromon can pretty much do the same thing like malaya while small could still grow pretty much to his size outside of it booker is different though not only did Booker get significantly more powerful within that battle arena, once he left the arena, he was pretty much back to how he was beforehand. Mm. Like, he can scuttle around, he can do things, but he can't shoot out paper blasts or anything like that. Mm. And then those extra blue ethereal pages Booker got during the fight are now back to being just ripped out spaces where pages have been removed. Well, that makes it difficult to train, and as a result, Hilda has spent a significant amount of her allowance on buying large quantities of printer paper <laughs> to use as practice darts for Booker to throw at little targets set up in the backyard. Does he sometimes eat the paper? I don't know. Does Booker eat paper? Booker ate her homework. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good point. So, yes. Booker eats things that he shouldn't be able to eat. Yeah, we're not sure whether it's because of jealousy or because he's gotten a taste for tree flesh. <laughs> but Booker has been messing with Hilda's textbooks. Hilda actually is currently grounded because Booker messed up a bunch of her textbooks, including one that became a late library book that Hilda had to pay for. Hilda cried a little bit having to like go to the librarians and say that the book was ruined. Booker felt kind of bad about it. <laughs> kind of. Was too busy staring down all the other books in the library like, don't you all fucking try. I'll take on all of you. Rackled. And uh, of course, as part of training, Hilda also needs to teach Booker the basic skills of survival. You know, how to set small ambushes for people like sticking a bucket on top of a door frame to fall on people <laughs> or like obtaining flowers that will squirt out water just you know some really basic survival skills booker has taken to scuttling up and perching on the tops of doors like where the bucket's supposed to be <laughs> and just flopping off it's quite dangerous oh it's so adorable oh <laughs> Oh. That sounds like a weird alt version of Alien. Got <laughs> <laughs> like a type of doors, and they're just waiting until your prey arrives. Does Booker enjoy face hugs? <laughs> paper cuts, more like paper hugs. No! <laughs> I said it, it's out there. That's Booker's philosophy now. I'm in charge of that. Anyways, a month is- Oh, Irene's been overachieving, <laughs> as per usual. <laughs> I didn't even feel the need to ask for Irene and Sparky. What is Irene doing? Overachieving and training. What is Sparky doing? Who the fuck knows? It's the same every month. Rutabaga! <laughs> Irene has walked into some of Hilda's pranks, potentially. Yeah. And she's really, really mad about it. Oh, don't you worry about that. Oh, great. Cool. Don't you worry about that. All right. So let's talk about where you all are. 
Hilda and Sparky, you walk through downtown Valley, which is starting to get Necromon fever. You can see that there are ads for Necromon things all over the place, scuba core ads. A lot of places have new Necromon themed drinks or Necromon themed discounts. You know, discount if you're a trainer. You walk past the construction site for this building, like the size of a sports stadium but you can see the scaffolding reaches up far above anything you can see. It reaches high, high into the sky. You can see the sign says, you know, under construction, the scuba core space scraper. I love it so much. <laughs> but you walk down and you make it to the Valley Theater, which is just packed in a massive line. You're probably waiting outside for probably a good while, like a half an hour already, until you eventually make it indoors. You know how theaters sometimes will adorn their walls with like specific posters of movies? All of these are the same movies. There's banners, bang, 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 bang. The word bang is all over the place. Everybody is here for Lucas Bang, or as he's better known, the aggressive bandit. The man who at the age of 17 became the first and only champion of the International Necromon Championship from the Valley. And inside, the crowd is a flutter. The folks working here are trying to balance taking tickets while also trying to get people ready for the signing because you can see not a lot of people are actually in the theater. Instead, there is a line of kids leaning up to this table, like you would have for signatures for a book or something. Right, cool. So when we get in there, Hilda's gonna be excitedly sort of like just bouncing up and down a little bit and say, so, so boss, I didn't know that you were a fan of the aggressive bandit too. Did you start following him after the Necromon championship? Mm -hmm. Oh no, no, honey, he's been following me. What? She fixes her jacket. No, 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 me, me and um, the aggressive bandit go way back. And Hilda is just like grabs onto one of your sleeves and is like, you have to tell me everything. Well, you know, um, you know, Pickle, that very high tier exclusive company that I ran in, in high school. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, he was part of it sometimes. He was like, um, a temp, if you will. <sighs> so he was part of the mystery solving investigative part too. He was. And also a Necromon trainer. He was, he was both just like you might be someday. Yes, yes. So, oh, I don't, I don't know if I can actually, oh, I don't what, what are you supposed to say to someone at a signing event? I don't know what I'm supposed to say when I get up there. How do I tell someone that I, I would like to, to do those things like they had done? Well, luckily for you, you have me who goes, I do way back with Luke. I'm going up with you. I am going up with you to see, to see, uh, to see Lucas Bay. You'll introduce me to the aggressive bandit? Yeah, yeah, yeah! And she takes her shoulder, kind of guides her into the line, and is like, yeah, I've got you, kid, I've got you, kid. I'll introduce you, and you can ask all the questions to your little heart's content. Oh, thank you, boss. Oh, I don't even know where to start. Oh, man. Mm. Rick up. Yeah, we should start with you, Booker. And Hilda will take Booker out and pat him. Booker seems pleased. Maybe he knows more about your type of necromon. We can learn all about ultras and why your powers are different in the arena and where you came from, all kinds of things. Very cool, very cool. Learn all things about, uh, about what? Oh, well. Well, you start by getting your ticket. And you look and you see you're at the ticket booth. And in front of them, you can see a very familiar face of a very tired teen in glittery, glamorous makeup. And Ariel looks down and says, hey, it's, uh, it's you. Oh, wow. Ariel, do you work, do you work everywhere in this town? Pretty much. That's really cool. Anyway, if you're gonna go get the bandit, make sure you grab one of these sleeves and they take a little card sleeve with like a little thing at the bottom saying, oh, it's owned by Scuba Core. It's for the Bang Bang movie. Mm -hmm. You don't want a complication of ownership or anything like that. A, 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 a what? You know, complication of ownership. 
So we know who's linked to a Necro card by signing it. If two people sign the same card, then everything gets all confused. Sometimes it's fine and the Necromon chooses one or both trainers, and sometimes poof. And they grab a little bit of confetti from their pocket and lackadaisically throw it in the air. The card can't handle it and explodes. So use one of these sleeves and uh, yeah, uh, ma'am, you can just wait over there while- Oh, 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 I was going to, uh, to go with her. Um, she needs me and, you know, um, Lucas Bay gonna go way back. Actually, speaking of which, um, <laughs> I didn't realize that, um, signing cards was going to be a problem. So could I actually have, um, 249 of those card sleeves? <sighs> Actually, I wanted to clarify, is this a card sleeve or is there also like a book cover sleeve for Booker? There is not a book cover sleeve for Booker. They only have card sleeves. Okay. Mm. Well, that's okay, Booker. We can just have him sign something else. Rickled. Could have him sign these 200. Well, if I get 249 card sleeves, you should have him sign those. (sighs) You can have mine, boss. It's very kind of you, Hilda, but just one won't fetch a price. Only six sleeves per trainer, ma'am. And uh, Ariel, Ariel, darling, you can give them all the card sleeves they need. We want to impress everyone. And next to Ariel, you can see this woman wearing a scuba core trench coat. (laughs) So around this, you've seen the normal people working here, but you also see lots of folks from scuba core and then a handful of undertakers, a handful of Rons serving as security. You could actually hear Ron 13 and Ron 12 as you went in just saying to each other, Ron 13, Ron 12, Ron 13, Ron 12, but like chest bumping each other. (laughs) But in addition to that, again, a handful of scuba core employees. This woman looks a bit different though. She is so shockingly pink. She's wearing the white scuba core trench coat, but underneath she's wearing a fitted pink suit and a pink pencil skirt with high pink heels. She's got bright pink lipstick, hot pink specifically, and then makeup covering like the lids of her eyes. She has long fake pink nails with little white hearts on them. And her hair even spirals out into this curly pink and white cotton candy shape. And this woman has her hand on Ariel's shoulder and it's just kind of clicking with the ends of her fingers. And Ariel starts speaking and is like, I mean, I, I guess, but the rules specifically, oh, the rules, pish posh. We put those aside for little cuties like you. And she grabs the tips of her fingernails and just pinches your cheek, Kilda. Mm. <laughs> and then, ma'am, did you say you needed to speak to the aggressive bandit as well? Ah, uh, yes. I'm going with the child that I brought. And we're going to... That sounded really creepy, and I'm <laughs> X-carding that. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I am her guardian, and I will be going with her to speak to the aggressive bandit. And Ariel puts their head in their hands and just murmurs to themselves... Oh, no mommy's way, Nada. (laughs) Ma'am, I've already told you the rules. Oh, don't worry about the rules, Ariel. After all, we allow both the young and the young at heart. (laughs) And she gives you a wink. And we know what Mr. Bang's demographics are, after all. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Uh-huh, yeah, 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 I bet you do. By the way, your jacket is so chic. It's got that kind of, I don't know, rustic retro aesthetic to it. I'm sure Lucas would love that. Anyways, you don't want anyone to scoot in front of you, Sparky and Hilda. So go next up in line. And if anyone gives you trouble and she hands out a glittering, glamorous, Heavily pink. It's like the text is pink on pink, so you can't see what it says. Business card to you and says, and if anyone gives you trouble, just tell them Maybelline sent you. (laughs) And she gives you a wink. And you could swear like glittery stars come out as she does it. Lucas does like this jacket. (laughs) 
She's gone. Her back is gone. She's walking away as you yell that. Sparky's really good at post-walk away zingers. <laughs> Hilda's just going to say, that's a tough break, boss. I was going to impress you with a new scheme to get all of the card sleeves, you know, through through conning. Really? And we have all the card sleeves, right? So she's gathering them up in her arms. And Sparky is like, no, no, tell me what your plan was. Well, you see, I actually came here earlier this week. And when I was here, I saved this little box over there in that hallway, like shoved in a corner. And inside that box are a bunch of like imitation papers. And I, I figured that this was just going to cut out while oh. Hilda's explaining the intricate details. But Sparky is thrilled like she is so proud and she looks like a proud parental figure as they walk into the line she's still fixing her jacket which is very cool maybelline and so you're waiting in line hilda's doing that some people are going in to see bang bang which i forgot to mention is a pg-13 movie for adventurous violence, mild sexual content, and one mm -hmm. F-bomb, you'll be surprised to learn who says it. <laughs> so you hear people talking about that. Some of them are openly talking about the movie as they walk out like, oh, can you believe when Lucas Bang, oh, the aggressive bandit, did this? Oh boy, he's real aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> he's real aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> but you're seeing the other people in the lines. It is a mixture of teens who came by their own and they're like in hoodies and trying not to look, you know, too nerdy because, you know, they're cool teens. God. To little over caffeinated children who are just hyping up and down, just bouncing. And the one that is probably vibrating the most is this small child who is holding a forearm cane in her left hand and is grasped onto a skeleton man with her right arm. You're sure excited about this, aren't you, Chapulin? Yanuin, or as Ariel calls her, Yuna, looks up to you, and you could swear there's just like a bright light as she smiles, and she lets go of your hand, and she motions to the lanyard on her chest, which has a little pick pit card on it, oh. and she excitedly motions to it, and she motions to Lucas Bang, who you've been waiting to see. And then she just bounces a little bit and you can just hear the <laughs> vibrating almost as hard as Toucan does when he does his jackhammer thing. <laughs> all right, all right. We're almost there. Just uh, just hang out a little bit, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna see him. Do you want him to sign your, uh, your car? Her mouth opens wide and then she just like, she gives you, like, a stern look, like, duh. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, we'll make sure they sign this card of yours, okay, princesa? <laughs> and she makes a little excited noise, and she turns over, and you can see she's looking at something else. And Hilda, you see as this girl who you've been sitting next to on the bus each morning, turns and points at you and waves her hand. And Hilda will wave back. Booker pokes up his little eye stalks. She does another wave for Booker. <laughs> Record. He can like turn his head to see what she's waving. It's like, oh, is it one of your school friend? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, kid. Because <laughs> he has noticed Hilda, but obviously behind Hilda is also Sparky. So he's going to like just wave very half-heartedly <laughs> at Hilda to be polite. Sparky lowers her sunglasses in the process of dropping the cards that she was holding and then not breaking eye contact with Kike, leading down and goes, Kike, I didn't know you liked All right, things. The, the line has moved. Let us go forward. I didn't know you liked things that are we fun. We don't want to lose any minute. The person in front of you is like, hey, dude, what's your problem? <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, man. Kike, Kike, you should come back here. Back in this place in the line. It'll actually get there faster than the front for mathematical reasons. Sorry, Sparky. I'm so far ahead in the line that I actually cannot hear what you're saying. Oops. <laughs> well, anyways, I hope you reach this place sooner, but not sooner than us. I want to note the line loops 
It does the thing where it zigzags back and forth. <laughs> God <laughs> damn it. So you two are literally standing right next to each other with a barrier in between you. Well, the the line won't change. He will still say those exact words. I know. While this is happening, Hilda has taken out Booker to play with you, Nan. Raccoon! Raccoon! And is excitedly, like, taking a look at the, like, the pick-pick card. Yeah, and she'll take out her pick-pick to play with Booker. Oh, no, wait. I play the pick-pick, too. I already forgot what its voice is. Kip, 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 kip. Kike was like would smile because he just really likes seeing his niece having fun. But as soon as Parky speaks to him, that smile is just going to like slowly go down into like a grimace. His mood is shifting like a coin being flipped through the air. <laughs> Kike, did they give you a hard time about joining the line to see Lucas Bang? Uh, why would they give us a hard time to join the line? I mean. Uh, okay. You know, maybe they give you a hard time joining anything, Sparky, and that's just more of a you issue. He's, he's making sure that you know and isn't listening to this. <laughs> listening to her uncle. Snark, because she is. Giving her a terrible example <laughs> of dealing with humans. Sparky has now collected all of her cards and is trying to like put them in a stack, but there are so many of them that a stack is like really hard to make, but she's doing her best with it. And just like, well, People don't really like investigative reporters snooping around. That's true, but I was just They sure don't. Wondering. Wouldn't know anything about that mm-hmm. myself, yeah, would yeah. I? You know, things do get a lot easier if people would just answer questions. You know, things don't have to be this hard. You know what also would get easier? If people didn't ask so many questions. That way, you know, maybe people would be nicer to investigative reporters if they just didn't break into somebody's house and flooded it with mice. Oh, that's right. If you don't mind me interrupting, uh, Mr. Kike. What's up, kid? You were part of Boss's big operation to clean up all of those necro mice that started swarming the street, right? Uh, yeah. yeah he didn't really do anything. It was, it was me and Tukin, yeah. Yeah, that's what I heard. You've had some kind of bird necromon. You kept that? Crackle. I didn't keep any like he's not mine he can come and go whenever he wants but i don't have it in a card or anything like that yeah i think that's really cool it's it's really interesting to see necromon get to wander around their own places booker doesn't really have to stay with me he just likes to i i I guess it's the same for toucan uh thanks I guess your book is pretty cool, too. Right, cool. I was gonna say, as he tries to be more of a cool man, saying cool things. Don't worry, you're a very cool book. He said it earnestly. I guess it didn't come across that but way. But you're an adult, so it's not cool when you say it. It's true. Anyways, if it's all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. The line shifts, and they're now slightly farther apart. Oh, what a what a bad coincidence! Now the line is moving for real. Now, sorry, oh, Sparky. The thing about oh. loops is that the come back to it. That's okay. We'll circle back, Kike. We always <laughs> circle oh, back. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. I'm too far away. Goodbye. <laughs> so you go back and forth for a good while, <laughs> doing this whole shtick, doing this thing for a couple of hours. You knew an. And Kike obviously get there before you do. I want to say that if at any point she gets tired, he's going to carry her on Aww. his shoulders. Yeah, she will part way through. But you go up, she talks to Lucas Bang, shows the little card on the lanyard. He signs it. It's super cute. But you make it to the front of the line, Hilda, and you notice that the aggressive bandit is talking to someone you haven't actually seen in line. All right, then, little partner. So who? Who should I make out this signature to? Make it out to Irene Hawthorne, please. No, don't add the please. I, I sure won't. I appreciate your specificity, though, ma'am. Can now, you I, actually I can s- put the grate in front of Irene Hawthorne? I certainly can. Uh, the great what? The great necromon trainer, of course. The greatest. Of course, of course, the great necro, the greatest necromon trainer. Now, I got your sleeves, but uh, what cards am I going to be putting these to? You know, I got to know what necromon we're making friends with. 
Irene hands him a blank card. I don't use cards, I just want your signature. I admire you greatly, but also it will be a good example of what I am striving to surpass. <laughs> I want you the roll convince somebody with fierce because I want to see if Lucas Bang gets intimidated. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Okay, so if I have two fears, I roll two dice. You always roll two dice and then you add whatever your value okay. is to that. <laughs> I got four. Four in total? Yes. So you fail. So it's snake eyes. Snake eyes? Did you roll? Oh, I didn't add the two. I didn't add the two. I'm sorry. So six. Okay, so you got a six. That's still a failure. <laughs> so... You get one AP. Your target is not convinced. He is not afraid. And I get to choose one drawback. They try to get in your way. They demand something in return. They make a vital misunderstanding. They're very upset with you for a long time. Um, Don't make him mad at me. I feel like a vital misunderstanding is the like only logical <laughs> conclusion here. Because Lucas Bang, Lucas Bang is not upset with this child. No, he is going to see that. And he's going to think that Irene doesn't have any mon. And he's going to be like, ha <laughs> aspirations that's very very good well it was a pleasure to meet you irene and he gives you a big smile irene looks at him with this dead expression <laughs> she was like you know rocking all the balls of her feet she was so excited but at his comment about aspirations she took it as Oh, you could try to get there because she's very confrontational. You can try to get up to my heights. And now she's got another rival. <laughs> and she stares him down and then takes her card sleep and leaves. Oh, Hilda, you're here. Oh, uh, hi, Irene. There's a long silence. You two know each other or what? Oh, yeah, Irene is the strongest trainer in the dueling club. At I school. am. It's not you? No, no, not yet. Hilda is my rival. Have you been training Hilda? I have. I have a pound and a half of blank printer paper with me right here in my backpack for more training and possibly to sign something if any of the other things I brought were not valid to be signed. That doesn't sound like efficient training. I thought it was very efficient to bring training materials with me while I go out to a signing event. I feel begrudging approval, <laughs> but you should try harder. Well, thanks, I guess. Uh, I, I, you should try I, uh, walking I, 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 away I, I, harder. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, excuse, excuse. I walk very hard. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. And you could hear a creak of like the table and chair as Lucas Bang is leaning over to you. To describe what he looks like, Lucas Bang is a man, probably somewhere in his 40s. He's wearing a suit, but the suit doesn't have a tie. It's open collar. He's built like an ox. I like to think of him as being literally the size of two dorm frames wide. Just this big, bulky guy. He's got short brown hair and a patch of dark brown five o'clock shadow. Essentially, he's Bob Parr from The Incredibles if you put Arthur Morgan from Red Dead Redemption 2's <laughs> face on him. Oh my god. And this face, which is really gentle and kind, is looking at the kids, but turns into alarm <laughs> when he looks up and sees the other person. And Lucas says, a little bit afraid, uh, hey there, Sparky. Uh, I'm curious, like, is, did Lucas Bang star in this movie? Because if so, I imagine, like, Sparky just wants to hear him say fuck because Lucas Bang, like Emily, would cry if he said uh, fuck. I'm imagining 
the Lucas Bang movie, like those movies they did with Elvis and also the movies they did with the Coco guy, where it's just like an excuse to have a famous person on a screen and the story isn't very good. But it's like, hey, we got Lucas Bang to be in this. Look at look at the way that we switched a story to be about the thing that he's good at. And there's like a young, there's a young actor. Mancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Mansi Drew, the famous actor slash investigator. Singer. And singer plays young Lucas Bang. I would love that. Well, gang, we're going to have a fun time today. We're going to have a good old, good old, it, uh, this voice is inherently evil. This is just an inherently evil voice. Inherently. I do not trust that voice. But I feel like he would always be the kind of guy, like even in high school, who would be like, over articulate the things he would say. I mean, I imagine him as as a child looking like it's tricky because there are real ghosts around, but I imagine him looking like the ghost of a child that died in the Blitz. Like he's got hair like this or like an orphan who was maybe drowned in a well behind a Victorian manor. Like he's just you don't trust him. He looks scary. He looks like an Adams family child, but like it's it's just it's just I, I could even go more posh if you want to. <laughs> And then, yeah, Maybelline, she's here. I had another follow-up that I didn't get to use of, now that's a Necromon trainer, boss. You can tell by the outfits. (laughs) (laughs) 